I'm Greg Jennett in Perth for this special edition of Afternoon Briefing. If some predictions are right, all eyes may well be looking west late at night on the 21st of May to decide the next Australian Government. So today, we'll take a look at some of the key seats in play here. I'm Fran Kelly in Sydney on the Gadigal land of the Aurora Nation. Well, day 19 and the halfway mark of this election campaign. Today, the news that your electricity bills are about to rise with wholesale power prices up 141% compared to the same time last year. Not great news for Scott Morrison as skyrocketing inflation figures have put cost of living pressures front and centre this week. Yes, friend, we've moved from Cottesloe Beach to Kings Park, still in the electorate of Curtin. As you say, day 19, well underway. It's the day that has seen Anthony Albanese released from COVID isolation and making his way here to the West. Down behind me, he'll be having Labor's official campaign launch this weekend to try to propel his party back into power. I feel really good today. I certainly feel much better today than I did yesterday. It's good to be out and about. <laughs> Later today, I'll be travelling to Perth with our campaign launch on Sunday. our advanced manufacturing sector our manufacturing center just like where we are here today is going strong they're making things, they're expanding their export opportunities. Here we go, here's one we prepared earlier. Picking up, but okay, it is me. Okay, so I'm here on Wadjuk country in Western Australia, Fran, and it is, as I was alluding to a moment ago, going to be the centre of political activity for the Labor Party with three weeks still to run. Uh, why is that so? Why, in such an unusual sense, has Labor decided to host an official campaign launch here in the West? Well, Fran, it's all got to do with the happy political fortunes of the McGowan government here in what was a really remarkable election result last year. Labor senses some opportunity, Fran, and that's what uh, this exercise is all about for Anthony Albanese and several hundred other ALP supporters who will be here uh, on Sunday. Yeah, that's right, Greg. It looks like a beautiful day there too. Anthony Albanese making fair play of the fact that this, is, that this campaign launch for Labor is, you know, the first major party campaign launch ever to be held in Perth. Um, Greg, meanwhile, cost of living pressures have inserted themselves into this campaign again um, with those a big jump in the wholesale electricity price, uh, which translates or will translate to more expensive power bills. I'm going to be speaking to Labor's Energy Shadow Minister Chris Bowen shortly, but first, you've managed to pin down Attorney General Michaela Cash there in Perth. Yeah, we did, Fran. And funnily enough, cost of living uh, is an issue that runs very hot here in the West as well. If we think some of the eastern states' economies localised are running pretty warm, uh, consider uh, an inflation rate here that localised is about 7% and really low unemployment. There's a bit of a pressure cooker environment there. We discussed that with Michaelia Cash as well as some other pressing issues. She does find herself in hot debate today with Mark McGowan. He's also emerged from COVID isolation to heavily criticise the Liberals, particularly in non-Western Australian states, so all the other states, over Senate preferencing deals. We started out our discussion with Michaelia Cash on that issue. 
Well, Michaela Yakesh, thanks so much for joining us on Afternoon Briefing, your home city it has is my turned home on. City, and, and we have turned it on for you, Greg, we really have. No, it's great to have you here in Perth, Western Australia. OK, why don't we cut to the news of the day. Yep. You've been engaged in a bit of a ding-dong battle with Mark McGowan, fresh out of COVID isolation, over Senate preferences. Why is your party outside the state of Western Australia giving preferences to UAP? Well, in the Liberal Party of Australia, preferences are decided on a state-by-state -state basis. I had made the commitment as the senior Western Australian here, uh, along with the Prime Minister, that the United Australia Party, Clive Palmer's party, would be put last in Western Australia. Why? Because as we know, Clive Palmer is no friend of Western Australia. And as you saw yesterday with the release of the How to Vote cards, that is exactly what the Liberal Party in Western Australia has done, unlike the Labor Party. Well, I think they are not preferencing the UAP in any state or territory. So why do you claim, or how can you claim some high moral ground in WA as an island if Clive Palmer is not a friend of WA, why not treat him or spurn him nationally? Different states will do different things. Our party is literally a federalist party and our states, they make their own decisions. Clive Palmer, as far as I am concerned and as far as the Western Australian Liberal team are concerned, is no friend of this state. I had made a commitment that we would not preference Clive Palmer. And despite all the song and dance, from the Labor Party when it comes to, it comes to Clive Palmer. When push came to shove, they have not preferenced Clive Palmer last. We have, and we have honoured our commitment. Would you have preferred that others stepped up and followed your lead, your insistence here in WA within Liberal Party branches elsewhere? Well, again, as a party, uh, whereby we are a federalist party and states do their own thing, literally, um, my influence is here in Western Australia. It was Clive Plamer who directly challenged our state. He is no friend of Western Australia. And as such, it is the Liberal Party here in WA who've placed him last. Unlike the Labor Party, who, despite their song and dance, despite everything they said about Clive Palmer, when they were tested, they failed the test. Right. They have not put him last on their How to Vote cards. No, not last, but I'm sure their counter-argument would be that they are not preferencing them ahead of other significant parties in other states. Let's move on to the dynamics of the campaign yep. here in this state, though. The hangover from the near-liberal wipeout in the state election last year. 60% of the vote yep. for the ALP. What leads you to believe that you're not tracking towards something of that magnitude again? Is the McGowan factor still at work? Well, in the first instance, I would say that the Western Australian people understand Mr McGowan is the Premier of Western Australia. This is a federal election. Mr McGowan remains the Premier after the election. You have Mr McGowan for the balance of the state term. The choice is between Scott Morrison, a true friend of Western Australia. He did deliver us the GST forever deal and Anthony Albanese. That is the choice. Scott Morrison, a strong economy and an even stronger future or Anthony Albanese, judge him on what he did to Western Australia the last time he was in office, yeah. imposed the mining tax. Anthony Albanese and Labor are no friends to Western Australia. So for that reason, have you shied away from any direct criticism of the McGowan government here in WA throughout the campaign? Well, I think what you would have seen, and in particular with the announcements that Scott Morrison and Mark McGowan make together, the Morrison government, a Liberal government, has a very cooperative relationship with the Mark McGowan Labor government here in Western Australia. Sounds like you you're have... trying to bask in reflected glory. No, not at all. We have a WA federal Liberal team who is committed to delivering for this state. That means we will work cooperatively with the government. And this government happens to be a Labor government. I mean, when Mr Morrison and Mr McGowan recently were together, both of us announced funding to enhance, I would argue, what already is an absolutely beautiful city. We'll give but you that. We'll give you a tick on that one. Uh, but, you know, as part of the Perth City deal, both of us have stepped up, Commonwealth Government and State Government, and we have said we will provide that additional funding that was required. So I think Western Australians see you have a strong Liberal team fighting for WA, working with 
the WA Labor government delivering for Western Australians. Yep, Pierce and Haslack agreed. Yeah. They're the two to be sandbagged, mostly. Oh, look, Ken Wyatt, outstanding member in Haslack, outstanding cabinet minister. I um, mean, you know, you walk out and about with Ken in Haslack, and quite frankly, even Labor voters will come up and say, Ken, we're voting for you. You're someone who understands our electorate, believes in our electorate, and delivers for your electorate. So your sense is he's looking OK? Ken is a very strong local member, and I would certainly put my money on Ken absolutely in oh. being returned. Pierce, obviously, we are losing the Liberal uh, Party can uh, member there, yep. and that's always tough. Any party that loses or a sitting member says, I'm going to retire, um, that's always a challenge because you automatically lose the name recognition. But I have to say, the candidate that we have, Linda Aitken, she is outstanding. She's a counsellor on the city of Wanneroo. She's a clinical nurse, uh, which people are responding to really well. And she is someone who just connects with people when she's out and about. Yeah. So Linda doing a fantastic job in Pierce. OK, there's one as well, which we won't go through in any detail. Uh, the economy yep. running very strongly here. You could almost say it's overcooking 7% inflation, 3% unemployment. Could that perversely become a liability? An economy that, that is staring down the barrel of interest rate rises and all the things that yeah, come well, with I pulling the Well, I think when you look at the choice that needs to be made between Scott Morrison, who has a plan for an even stronger economy and stronger future, and Anthony Albanese, the choice is pretty clear. You look at what we've done as a government over the term that we've been in, in, in office and what we've delivered back to Australians, whether you're a business, a small business, 30% tax rate under Labor, 25% under us, or an individual. Yeah. So income tax on $90,000, under us, you're around $2,600 better off. But at the same time, we recognised in the budget cost of living pressures. Yeah. Hence, the reduction in the fuel excise, the $420 that people will get when they put their tax return in, the $250 uh, payment that's currently hitting the yeah. bank accounts of those who need it. All of which was agreed to in a bipartisan sense, at least in the Parliament. And just finally, Integrity Commission. We've been out yeah. in Cottesloe today yeah. talking to the somewhat surprisingly strong yeah. candidate in Kate Cheney. She's naming an integrity commission as a key bargaining chip. Is that something you could imagine that a return Morrison government would be prepared to negotiate over in the event of a hung parliament? Well, the Prime Minister has made it very clear. In the first instance, we are seeking a majority in the parliament yes. to govern on our own. Secondly, if we are given that honour, we have a mandate to then implement our model of the Commonwealth Integrity Commission. And but if not, if in a hung parliament scenario... The Prime Minister's made it clear. Independents bring nothing to the parliament. And I know we call them independents, but they're not. They're a group of people who've come together across Australia under the banner of a very well-funded Climate 200 party. So basically, the independent here in Western Australia has been controlled out of the eastern states. Western Australians do not like that. They are not true independents and they bring nothing other than chaos and instability to any future government. And yet Kate Cheney does pose a significant threat, almost in an unthinkable way, in what was Liberal Party heartland. That tells you something about well, the ability to keep up with the issues of concern to voters there, doesn't Kate it? Cheney Climate, was, integrity. Kate Cheney was a member of the Labor Party last year. She, she's not someone who can call herself a Liberal when she was a member of the Labor Party. She is someone who has been controlled by Eastern States' interests. Western Australians don't want that. Celia Hammond is someone who, as part of the Morrison government, as part of the government, is able to deliver directly for the people of her electorate. What does an independent offer? Nothing other chaos and instability. And I would say, as we look to the future, and in particular given the last two years of COVID, mm. the last thing Australians want, the last things Western Australians want, is chaos and instability. Do you, do you think a hung parliament is a live possibility right now? Oh, look, based as I on am the, out the and feedback about, and yep, the polls. Every day, I am 
welcomed by people. People come up and say, we know you've given us a strong economy. We appreciate the decisions you've made that saved tens of thousands of lives. And you have a clear plan, not just for Australia. We've released a clear plan for Western Australia. So I'll take that as a no to a hung parliament then. <laughs> no, well, I can tell you, I know what I'll be doing over the next 22 days, every single day, out and about, in the electorate, meeting people and explaining to them that clear choice. Scott Morrison, strong economy, stronger future. Or. We'd expect nothing less from you. Michaela Cash, thanks so much for joining Great us to be on with you, Greg. Briefing. Thank you. And those cost of living pressures again dominated the campaign today with news that household power bills are set to rise steeply. Also today, Anthony Albanese emerged from COVID isolation to make his way to Perth for Labor's campaign lunch on, launch on Sunday. Uh, joining him there will be Chris Bowen, but the... Uh, Shadow Labor Shadow Minister for Climate Change and Energy. Join me now from his electorate of McMahon in Fairfield in Sydney's West. Chris Bowen, thanks very much for joining us. Pleasure, Frank. Good to be with you. Chris Bowen, let's deal with this issue of power prices first. Uh, if prices are exploding because of outages and closures at coal-fired power plants, is the answer more or less coal-fired power in our energy mix? Well, the answer is investment in renewables, the answer is investment in transmission, and the answer is policy certainty. This is a direct result, Fran, of nine years of policy chaos. Energy policy after energy policy, lack of investment certainty. We know that investment in renewable energy is down, and this AEMO report, the report from the regulator, specifically mentions 17 times the problem of lack of investment in transmission. Labor's the only party with a plan to invest in transmission through our rewiring the nation policy, which will bring on more renewables. It'll provide more stability, more reliability and lower prices. We're the only party with a plan for lower power prices. We're the only party with a plan for more renewables. We're the only party with a proper framework for the transformation that has to happen in the Australian energy market. How quickly would your plan bring down power prices? Because analysts are saying that they're set to rise very steeply, could be as high as 50% in the medium term. So how quickly could you, could you avert that? Well, as you know, Fran, we released our policy on December the 3rd last year and we released the most comprehensive economic modelling that any opposition sure, has ever released for a time frame. about any policy ever. Yeah, and that modelling showed a reduction of $275 in average by 2025. That's what the modelling shows as a result of our policy framework, the stability and certainty that we would provide, and also, very importantly, the important investment in transmission in a document that's called the ISP. It's not the, the sexiest, most high-profile document, but it's an extremely important one. It's the roadmap that has been written by the experts on what transmission we need to invest in to get renewable energy from where it's produced to where it's consumed. Well, and just on that, the because the Prime, Minister the, took a to big, actually invest in it. the Prime Minister took a big shot at your transmission policy today. He said you're going to gold plate the transmission network and that'll push up prices. Yeah, well, that's the sort of lazy, dishonest rhetoric we've got from a Prime Minister who's out of plans himself. I mean, everybody agrees the ISP is important but the government's not investing in it. Let's have a look yes, at Scott Morrison's track record. Yes, but is Labor planning to use record. taxpayers' What's money to invest in transmission that the, uh, that the regulator says is not a first priority? That's not true. No, no, that's not right, friend. The, the AMMO has laid out the ISP, and the, the ISP is the investments they feel are necessary. There is no... That is just a lie from Scott Morrison. But let's look at his track record. He said he would invest in Marinus Link. They, they committed to that seven years ago nothing's happened. They said they'd do Snowy 2.0, which, which is being built. They're not plugging it into the grid for years. It's, it, it will sit there without that investment. They said they'd have a grid reliability fund three years ago. Not one project has been invested in out of the grid reliability fund because they are so chaotic and dysfunctional internally. Right. They couldn't even deliver it. That's their track record. We have a plan to invest in transmission. There's no transition without transmission. We need to get the energy from where it's produced to where it's consumed. That'll be good for reliability, good for prices and good for the environment. Just before we leave the issues of your portfolio, the government's labelled your emissions reduction policy as a sneaky carbon tax. You say it's not a tax, but how much more will the big emitting industries be paying, presumably passing those costs on to all of us? No, again, that's, that's covered in the modelling, Fran. It's covered in the modelling so and prices the answer? come how down much under more, our policy. How much more will the, the cement industry be, play, be paying? Well, well, on Scott Morrison's ridiculous claim, I mean, this is just the lazy rhetoric of the toxic politics okay, of how climate much change more? the Liberal Party's engaged in 20 years. It's, again, it's all covered in the modelling, Fran, but 
Uh, in relation to their claim, I mean, they have the safeguards mechanism now. There are companies that buy carbon credits now under them, under their policy. They won't like to admit that. That happens today. We will make the policy work. The beauty of the safeguards mechanism is that it's designed to be facility by facility so the clean energy regulator can work with each facility for a proper trajectory to net zero by 2050. You must That's have what modelled, though, you does. must have modelled how What's much these big emitters more will be paying more under you because you will be raising that, raising yeah, that baseline. I'm, or lowering it, actually. Yeah, we will make the baseline a, a trajectory to net zero. Either you believe in net zero or you don't. We do, and but we have policies cost. to implement it. Scott Morrison claims to, and he doesn't. And the modelling outlines how that would work. The okay. facilities would have the capacity to offset if they chose or make direct investments if they chose. Okay. That would be up to them. Other questions that have emerged today in the campaign. The man in charge of Operation Sovereign Borders, Rear Admiral Justin Jones, has released a video in multiple languages warning people that Australia's borders remain closed to people smugglers. Now, Border Force says this wasn't done at the government's request. Scott Morrison is suggesting Border Force may have done it because Labor's confusion will encourage people to get onto boats. What do you say? Well, let me make two key points, Fran. Firstly, this video from Border Force supports our point. There will be no change of policy when it comes to sovereign borders, to Operation Sovereign Borders. We support boat turnbacks, we support offshore processing. And this video from Border Force is making that very point. Secondly, Scott Morrison is being deeply irresponsible when he cast out over this. I mean, as a former Immigration Minister, Fran, I can tell you that the chatter and the intelligence is constant and they look at every nuance. And when the Prime Minister says, oh, there'll be a weakening of policy, they'll be listening to that. So he is playing into the hands of people smugglers with that okay. rhetoric and that is deeply irresponsible on his behalf. Also today, the Solomon Islands Prime Minister, Sogavare, has criticised the Australian Government for striking a secret deal, he said on AUKUS, without consulting the Pacific family, noting his government didn't, quote, get theatrical or hysterical at that time. Labor supports the AUKUS deal. It's been critical of the China Solomon Security yes. Pact. It doesn't really bode well for future relationships with the Solomons, no matter who wins, does it? Who wins our election? Well, we'll call it, we'll call it as we see it, Fran. We do support AUKUS, and I do note in relation to Prime Minister Sogavare's comments that AUKUS is a public arrangement. It's a public document, uh, unlike the arrangement between the Solomon Islands and China, which is not public. And if uh, Prime Minister Sogavare is going to lecture other countries, they might like to make the agreement with China public. That would be a step forward for transparency. OK, just finally, Labor's official campaign launch on Sunday. Your, your primary vote hasn't really shifted in the first three weeks of this campaign. How important is this launch to send a big message to voters about Labor's plan for government? Or are you just going to rely, really, on your anti-Morrison message <coughs> to try and get elected? Well, every, every speech is important, every day in a campaign is important, every launch is important. Well, this is a pretty big moment for an opposition place, leader. What's going to be front and centre there? Of course. Well, uh, this election is real close, Fran. I mean, this election is tight. We're not taking any vote, any seat for granted. Uh, I, ex I, I am sure the launch will be a great day, an important day. I'm looking forward to it. I'm sure that the launch builds on, builds on what we've already announced uh, in our climate change policy, very comprehensive, out on December the 3rd, our childcare policy, our housing policies that have already been announced, plenty of policy already out there, Fran, a big alternative being put to the Australian people. Uh, but, of course, in any election campaign, you get more announcements during the course of the campaign and, uh, 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 of course, any campaign launch is a big day for a party. I think that's the same as saying watch this space. Chris Bowen, thank you very much for joining us. Well, I'm not making, uh, I'm not making the campaign sports, uh, launch speech today and uh, I won't be making it on Sunday either. That's for Anthony to do on Sunday. Chris Bowen, thanks. Well, Greg, I don't know if that means there's not going to be a big statement at the middle of the campaign launch speech or he just wasn't going to tell us about it. What do you think? Oh, I'm sure there'll be a few gems and announceables, as they call them, Fran, in Anthony Albanese's speech. There always is. Constrained, of course, this time around by the budget position. But then that is status quo for Labor's campaign throughout. They are being as modest as possible. But I suppose more interesting, Fran, is the fact that they've decided to come here in the first place. And that is both unconventional but also logical when you consider the landmark electoral event that happened here last year. I mean, there is a McGowan factor. We can discuss, if you want, Fran, uh, how how you know strong that remains I guess that's the question that's going to be answered on the 21st of May but uh, yeah it's I was struck by your Labor question to, to um I was struck by your question to Michaela Cash it seems like sort of implying that really both sides in this election are trying to get a little bit of that um that Mark McGowan glow if you like 
and she didn't shy away from it, did she? Which is no. kind of perverse in a way. I mean, Scott Morrison and Mark McGowan have a certain history through National Cabinet and the pandemic, uh, certain friction points there. But look, I suppose conventional political logic says, why wouldn't you at least run dead on attacking Labor and the McGowan government in this state? If you can sidle up or you know, at least be neutral towards them, you may as well. And that's by sheer weight of numbers, Fran. I mean, 60% of the primary vote for the McGowan government here, you could almost fit the opposition in in a minibus. So uh, that pro provides the logic for Anthony Albanese bringing the Labor caravan here, uh, but also for the remarks of, uh, of the Attorney General who we spoke to a little earlier. But we wanted to bring in our other federal political reporter, Jane Norman, who is who is uh, who's from Western Australia originally, very familiar with the state. And Jane, you've spent a lot of time on the ground here trying to tap into the mood of the electorate in the last couple of days. In answer to Fran's question, why has Labor brought the caravan here and how big is the McGowan factor? Yeah, well, Greg, I think one word is opportunity. Um, Labor has clearly spied rare opportunity here in the West. Um, it is a Liberal stronghold at a federal level and it has been like for decades. It's at the moment 10 of the 15 state seats are held by the Liberal Party. But this time around, Labor is going to try and end that decades-long dominance. And as we've been discussing, it's targeting three seats in particular, Swan and Pearce, Given that the local the, the Liberal members are retiring, there's an opportunity there and also has luck. But it should be noted that winning all three seats is a really big ask. Firstly, because back in 2019, Labor didn't manage to pick up any extra seats in WA. It's stuck with the five it has. And also to, to gain seats like has luck and Pierce, you're looking at swings that Labor hasn't achieved here in WA since the Rudd slide of 2007. But you talk to the Labor side and what's changed is that local political landscape. It is the wildly popular Premier Mark McGowan and you do have both leaders positioning themselves as McGowan's mate. But in that landslide election last year, the Liberal Party was decimated. It's got two MPs in the state parliament. So what they've lost is um, the campaign machine is weakened, the brand has been damaged and a lot of it had to do with the early opposition to the hard border. And Scott Morrison didn't help because he backed Clive Palmer's challenge to the hard border. And uh, you can now see just how far Scott Morrison is trying to distance himself from Clive Palmer um, with Michaelia Cash telling you that the Liberal Party won't be directing any preferences at all to the Palmer Party here in WA. Well, not in this state. Not That's in this right, state, in WA. There so are other deals what I think Mark McGowan regards as sneaky deals mm. in other states by Liberals on the Senate, how to vote cards. Yeah. All right, but um, no matter how damaged the Liberal brand was from last year, it has had to scrape a campaign effort together, including candidates. Mm -hmm. Just tell us of those three seats that are significant, what we know about the, the matchups. Yeah, I mean, like, I think Swan is really the one to watch. It's the one that the Liberals are most worried about, and that's because it's the most marginal. It's held by 3.2%. And given that it's lost the incumbency of Steve Irons, just as Pierce has lost the incumbency of Christian Porter, they're the real targets for Labor. So Liberal Christy McSweeney uh, is hoping to hold on to this seat for uh, the, the Liberal Party. And really, just as it is elsewhere, the economy is the central pitch here. And I asked Christy McSweeney when I caught up with her this morning in South Perth um, how that goes with the fact that cost of living is a big issue and inflation in the West is higher than the national average. Let's take a listen to what she had to say. The flip side of that cost of living is that unemployment in WA is at 3.4%. Anybody who wants a job can have one. Anybody who wants to take on an apprentice can have one. Anybody who wants to be an apprentice or embark on new training can do that. Um, and people are buying houses, finishing their apprenticeships. They're investing in utes and boats. And it is a really, really good story to tell. So you can see the kind of economic extremes there. Now on the Labor side, as I mentioned, there were big hopes and expectations in 2019, but the party didn't manage to pick up seats just like Swan. This time around, Zanita Mascarinas is hoping she might prevail. And um, I asked her about her prospects in that seat when I caught up with her during some door knocking in Kudal yesterday. In 2019, there was yeah. big hopes that Labor yeah. would be able to gain a few seats here in the West yeah. that didn't eventuate. Yeah. What's different this time around? The, I think 
it, it is that the electorate knows Scott Morrison and they don't like him. The, he's had the opportunity to lead Australia through different crises, whether that's the bushfires or the pandemic or, or even like the Solomon Islands. And the truth is he's failed at every single stage. And that was the Labor candidate Zanita Mascarinas there. So very tight race in Swan. Neither side is willing to say which way it'll go, but you know, perhaps this time Labor might actually prevail. All right, thanks for that summary, Jane Norman. And we will catch up with a Labor MP in Anne Ali just a little bit later, Fran, to get her perspective. It's a tight seat that Anne Ali holds in Cowan, but uh, you know, the dynamics there are probably going to be similar to the seats on the Liberal side of the pendulum that Jane just summarised for us. Yeah, and as Jane was saying there, you know, last time, remember, Greg, the last election, Labor had high hopes, were really talking up their chances in the West, came up short, came up with nothing. We heard Chris Bowen say to us earlier, this election campaign is tight. Um, and yet there they are in the West, investing all that time and getting there and being there. As you mentioned earlier, they, they see it as a happy hunting ground. Uh, I, I wonder if they've got sort of real hopes of, you know, or how realistic their hopes are this time. Yeah, I guess the proof will be in the pudding, but there's no um, harm in trying, is there? I mean, if you could transfer those results from last year to any other state, let's say the Palaszczuk government had achieved a result like this in Queensland, then Labor would be making a beeline there too. It's, it's only logical. Yeah, as you say, they've got two MPs there, the Liberals in the West. You said they can fit in the minibus. I think they could fit in the mini minor, Greg. We'll discuss where this campaign <laughs> yeah, is sure. at, the, at this halfway mark. I spoke earlier to the ABC's political editor, Andrew Probin, and the host of Insiders, David Spears. <music> Andrew Probin, David Spears, welcome to Afternoon Briefing. Hi, Good friend. Uh, Probes, Labor's formal campaign launch in Perth on Sunday in the marginal Liberal seat of Swan. Why have they chosen to launch their campaign in Perth? Well, quite simply, WA is the land of opportunity for the ALP this, this election. They think that they can pick up an extra two, three seats in WA, and that's why Anthony Albanese, Albanese is heading there today. OK, David, speaking of Anthony Albanese, he's back on the trail after COVID ISO. He's going to have to spring back into action. Has he been missed on the campaign trail and, you know, is he fighting fit? Well, both good questions, uh, Fran. Look, he looks he looks pretty good for someone, you know, a week from being diagnosed. Uh, anyone who's had COVID will know, though, that you're not 100% even after the first That's week. That's right. Uh, it can take a little while. But, it, you know, everyone's different, so we'll see. It's going to matter, though, because things will step up a few gears in the final few weeks of the campaign. It'll need to be, uh, you know, tip-top. Um, has he been missed? Well, you know, the empirical data, the polls don't suggest, you know, we've seen Labor really suffer while he's been away, I think for a couple of reasons. Most of the Labor team that stepped up, perhaps not all of them, but most of them did a pretty good job. Uh, you know, Jim Chalmers, Katie Gallagher, Jason Clare, uh, Penny Wong in particular. Uh, and it kept the focus really on Scott Morrison, which is what Labor's campaign's all about, about trying to keep the negative focus on, on, the, on the PM. And if anything, I think the PM dialed back for a day or two uh, during uh, Albanese's absence as well. But look, now's when it really matters. He's back, and as I say, it'll depend just how sharp he is over the next few weeks. Well, just a quick one from both of you. We are at the midway point of this campaign now. You know, what tends to change at this moment and who is in the box seat? David, you mentioned the polls there. They've held up for Labor quite well. Will Labor, can Labor take a lot of heart from that? Just to you quickly. Yes, I think they can. Uh, both sides acknowledge Labor's in front. Um, you know, there are differing, differing degrees of um, pessimism on the, uh, on the coalition side right now. Some still believe they can win this. The trajectory is right for them. But a, a number of those I've spoken to are becoming increasingly worried, uh, particularly about the, you know, the teal independent seats and so on, their inability to get to a majority um, or even a minority government. But, uh, look, yes, the, the polls, the public polls, national polls, they really haven't budged a great deal, you've got to say. Morrison's personal numbers have improved, but Labor's maintained that lead over the coalition. So, yes, they would absolutely be heartened by that right now. Andrew? Look, I concur with what uh, Spearsy's just talked about. Uh, I think there's a couple of reasons, too, that have favoured the Labor Party. Uh, the national security aspect of this fight, uh, we, we always hear that the Coalition want to talk about the borders and national security, but the Solomons deal between Beijing and Honiara has really uh, smacked the Morrison government about. And also the inflation figure now on, on the economy, that's been a, a real hit to 
the, the coalition stocks. That said, um, Scott Morrison and his ministers st still are comfortable talking about the economy. Mm. Um, maybe they have to because it's their, uh, one of their last, uh, last tricks. Uh, and they also seem to be keen talking about national economy, uh, about national security. But on both those fronts, they aren't quite as um, wonderful assets to the coalition as they perhaps would have liked, they would have liked to have been at the start of the campaign. Now, today, the Solomon Islands Prime Minister has criticised the Australian Government in his own parliament for blindsiding the Pacific family over the AUKUS security pact. He made some very pointed comments about a sovereign country being able to enter into any treaty it wants, of course, and told his parliament, talking of the Solomons, we did not become his theatrical or hysterical, Mr Speaker. David, this is a real put-down, attempted put-down of Scott, Morris, uh, Scott Morrison, isn't it? Yeah, it is. Look, a couple of points to make here. It is curious that Prime Minister Sogavare hasn't raised this criticism, at least publicly, until now, when he's absolutely copping it uh, over this deal, the security deal that's been done with China. So I do think that's... It, it, it does look a little odd. Um, but, you know, clearly the, the nature of this relationship is now where he's willing to have a whack at, at, at Australia and at Prime Minister Morrison in particular. Secondly, the way uh, Prime Minister Morrison spoke about this this afternoon when he was talking to reporters in Tasmania, I thought was really interesting. He made the point that he spoke to Sogavari the day after the AUKUS deal and he suggests there was no problem raised uh, and then went on to say that what's happened since then, it's notable that now he has a different tone that's aligned with China's view of the AUKUS deal. So he's effectively saying, you know, the guy is now mouthing China's concerns about our AUKUS arrangement. This relationship has sunk, no doubt about it, to the point where it now looks like the Australian Prime Minister is willing to call out the Solomons PM for being too close to China and potentially even undermine his standing in the Solomons. Yeah, I mean, Andrew, how's that going to go down in the Solomons, in the Pacific? And also, is this bad news for Scott Morrison to have the Solomons Island Prime Minister prepared to speak out like this, to speak to Australia like this? I don't think Scott Morrison will much care about what uh, Sogavari has said. There's obviously some bad blood there, a lot of distrust too, and whoever wins on May 21, the job of the Australian government, the job of the diplomatic corps will be to see if they can undo uh, this agreement. Uh, it has been signed, but uh, Sogavari has got his political enemies. There is still uh, substantial uh, elements of civil unrest, as we saw back last year when Australia sent uh, troops and police. Okay. So the question now is, is whether uh, this progresses and whether there are, are um, uh, whether it's political pressure on Sogvari in his home country. Okay. Um, but effect by effectively accusing him of parroting uh, Beijing is quite a remarkable turn of events. Yeah, gloves off. Uh, David, a quick one to you on the economy. The inflation figures sort of descended into the middle of this uh, election mm. campaign this week. The Prime Minister and the Treasurer making the point that a lot of it's international pressures. But do you think that's going to influence people or make people feel any better about their own situation and certainly this government if mortgage rates go up, for instance, if their interest rates go up? Look, cost of living is on everybody's mind. Doesn't matter where you go in the country, um, you know, we've all been spending a bit of time in marginal seats. Yesterday I was in Boothby in South Australia, talking to as many people as I could, vox popping, trying to find out their issues. Cost of living was a big one. Some of them do acknowledge this is all international factors, not much we can really do about in Australia. So yes, there is that element of understanding there. But look, is it is it going to, is everyone going to cut the government slack here? I doubt it. I think a lot of people will just be feeling the squeeze. And the almost daily reminders, the inflation data, Wednesday, rental data yesterday, today we hear power prices are going up, next week it'll be interest rates. So it's this constant you know, reminder of the pressure that the family budget is under. That's the real problem uh, here for the Prime Minister. Look, you would have seen him this afternoon and you will see him in the days and weeks ahead uh, articulating what they have done in the budget, some of the goodies, the petrol tax cut and the other handouts. Mm. But that, that's all stuff that's already been done. What can be done in the future to tackle this problem? That's all temporary measures. OK. We don't hear much. All right. Just time for a yes or no answer from both of you on the next one. Debates. The Prime Minister's agreed to two debates, both on commercial networks. Only trouble is no, no one bothered to ask Anthony Albanese if he could be there or would be there at those times. Uh, probes, should Anthony Albanese front up to both those debates or should he hold his ground and uh, push for one at the National Press Club, for instance? 
Well, I think he should push for one at the uh, ABC, but I think he should turn up for those debates. I think the, the more we see them tested, the better for all of us. David, what do you reckon? Yeah, it takes two to tango on uh, uh, agreeing to debates. We've all seen this debate over debates, uh, you know, mess up every election campaign or be a distraction every election campaign. Agree, more than debates, the better. But absolutely there should be one on the ABC. And, uh, yes, we've got our pitch out there, and I can go through many reasons why it should be on the public broadcaster, but you'd expect me to say I don't know why they wouldn't prefer one with you any day of the week, David. <laughs> David, Andrew, thanks very much for joining us. Thanks, Fran. Thanks, Fran. <laughs> Well, by far the most marginal seat here in Western Australia is not on the Liberal side, but it's actually held by Labor MP Anne Ali in the seat of Cowan. And Anne is with us here in Kings Park. Welcome back to Afternoon Briefing. And you're looking remarkably relaxed. Which Me? Really? I'm, <laughs> I'm, I'm sort of keen to explore with you because anyone who's sitting on a margin of 0.9% should be very nervous Indeed, so says conventional political logic. Mm. Uh, if I interpret your body language as someone mm. who feels pretty comfortable, what does that tell us about the Labor psychology after the McGowan government state victory last year? Oh, well, first of all, Greg, don't let the looks fool you. <laughs> okay. um, yeah, I don't take anything for granted. I know that I've been working hard in Cowan over the last six years of representing the seat since 2016, or five years since uh, since I got elected and representing the seat. So I'm out there every weekend. I'm out there every day. Um, door knocking, I take absolutely nothing for granted. I know that Cowan, like any other marginal seat, will be hard to hold. Well, you were around here last year. We, from the East and states were not. What is materially different? I mean, as we look around today, mm. most of the COVID restrictions, if not all of them, have disappeared. How do those changes with the pandemic carry over or transfer from what happened for the McGowan government's campaign to the one you're having to wage now? Mm. Mm. I'm going to assume they're significantly different. Uh, look, I think there is some difference there. I think what we're seeing now is that primarily the, the, the first issue on people's minds is cost of living. Uh, that's certainly when I'm out door knocking in, in Cowan, when I'm out speaking to people in Cowan, that's front of mind for people. They're concerned about what's going to happen after the election. They're looking for answers about how do we how do we ride this high inflation and this cost of living. Well, what are your answers to well, that? Well, they're not seeing any answers with the Liberal government, let me tell you that. Uh, what they're but it seeing, could actually what... be worse for uh, an incoming Anthony Albanese government. If the Reserve Absolutely. Bank goes ahead and jacks well, up well, interest well, rates? Well, any government that's going to, be, to come in after May, whatever May brings, will be inheriting a trillion dollars of debt with nothing to show for it and a high, high inflation and high cost of living. But the difference there is that we have a plan that goes beyond a $250 uh, payout to, to, to people, which, which we support, but doesn't go very far when inflation is up at a national average of 5.1. Okay, so that plan is, I know you're going to say Increasing your wages, uh, uh, productivity, manufacturing, childcare, cracking down on multinational tax Tax None of avoidance. which you have direct control over. You can seek to influence, but they are not things that could be directly controlled by an Anthony Albanese government. In terms of childcare, well, in terms of all of those wages, things, absolutely they can. Well, you can, you can, you can have the right settings to increase productivity. And I know that when I'm out talking to businesses in Cowan, that's what they're crying out for. They're crying out for a government that has the right settings for them to be able to manufacture in Australia, to be able to grow in Australia, and they're not getting that from this government, particularly, particularly if they are looking in the renewable space and the recycling space, anything to do with climate change. OK, so some of our coverage today, and has explored the idea that Labor, if not the coalition government, is trying to bask in the glory of the McGowan government's mm. victory and it's very high stakes late last year. Uh, do you sense any of that has carried over um, to this day or, or was that a peak that was hit last year? Look, I year? think the reason that McGowan, Mark McGowan is so popular is because he has done the right thing by Western Australians. He's kept us safe. He's fought back Clive Palmer, who was backed by a Morrison government uh, in trying to bring down WA. He's kept us safe. He's kept WA strong. Our economy is strong. And that's why he's popular. He's not just popular just because he's Mark McGowan. He's, the proof is in the pudding and he's yeah. done a lot for, for really developing and, and changing people's minds about the Labor the brand. Um, so I think that's all credit to Mark McGowan. Um, and, you know, 
time and time again, the Morrison government have proven that they are against the people of WA. They sided with Clive Palmer against Western Australia and they're siding with him again in a national, uh, a national uh, preference deal. For the Senate seats for outside, the Senate seats. Of, outside, outside Western of WA, but Western Australians aren't fooled by that. Okay, so we saw that groundswell last year. Mm. Where is it uh, apparent when it comes to Anthony Albanese? Is Anthony Albanese a Mark McGowan? Well, no, of course. You know, they're two very, uh, they're two different people, and I think so you know, brand, that's rec not, brand that's recognition not, here pull, in Western Australia. Well, let's not treat people like mugs, right? People know the difference between state and federal. And Anthony Albanese I, and Labor have stood on our own two feet and presented the people of Western Australia with a positive plan to move forward in uncertain economic conditions. We have a plan for the future that goes beyond a 250 hit. While the Liberals have a plan to win the election, we have a plan for Australia for the future. And I think we've got strong legs to stand on in WA. We've got a lot to offer the people of Western Australia. And I think having, uh, you know, on Sunday, as sure. you know, you, uh, the reason that you're here is that we're launching, Anthony Albanese is launching the campaign here. That is a true demonstration of the fact that Anthony Albanese will be a Prime Minister for all of Australia. A demonstration of just how important Western Australia is to the national right. uh, okay. uh, economy. Well, good luck uh, to those in the West and for you in the remaining three weeks of your campaign. And Ali? Thanks, uh, thanks so much thanks, for joining Greg. us. All right, so we have been referencing Premier Mark McGowan and this uh, spat. He's come out of COVID isolation today, criticising Liberals beyond Western Australia for Senate how to vote cards. Why don't we hear directly from the West Australian Premier? Well, it is disgraceful. I haven't, in, I haven't had much to say about the federal election, but I'm going to say this. I mean, doing a deal with Clyde Palmer, seriously, seriously, the Liberal Party has lost its way. If you're going to do that, you've really scraping, you've, you're really heading to the bottom. And I just say to um, the Liberal Party, they should not be engaging with Mr Palmer. He's the one who challenged Western Australia's border controls that saved countless lives and saved our economy. He's the one who took us to court or to arbitration for $30 billion, which is $12,000 for every man, woman and child in Western Australia. And we had to pass special laws to stop it. Um, I just say to the Liberal Party, this is a pretty low and a pretty disgraceful act to engage with Mr Palmer. And I would have expected better of them. Now in the state election, obviously they did the same with Pauline Hanson, One Nation, and the state election before they did the same with One Nation. There's got to be some standards. There's got to be some things that you will not do. But clearly the Liberal Party has now jumped the shark and is um, prepared to do anything to hold on to office, and I just hope people take account of that when they go to vote. Okay, so as you'd expect, the ABC's local news operations has had reporters fanned out around Western Australia, and particularly here in the city of Perth, trying to track the first movements of opinions and detections of mood uh, in the voters here among three seats in particular jake Sturmer is one of them jake uh, thanks for joining us this afternoon you've had a particular focus out and about in hasluck liberal held tell us what you picked up there yeah indeed hasluck is probably one of the three liberal uh, Liberal seats that Labor is hoping to pick up, but it'll probably be the hardest of them. And that's because Swan and Pierce both have retiring sitting MPs, and so it's two fresh candidates. Whereas Hasluck has a, a well known incumbent uh, cabinet minister in Ken Wyatt, the Minister for Indigenous Australians. And he is taking on Labor's Tanya Lawrence. It's a, it's a job that's just become a little bit harder for her thanks to the redistribution because the seat has gone from 5.4% to the Liberals uh, to 5.9% after the, the redistribution, certainly notionally. And so it's going to be an extraordinary swing uh, if Labor is to pick up has luck on, that, uh, on those kind of numbers. But what you get, the sense that you really get when you go out and speak to people in has luck is the overwhelming popularity of Mark McGowan. No matter what you ask about federal issues, Mark McGowan comes up and his handling of COVID comes up. Uh, OK, so just to summarise that, in your own assessment, I know it's anecdotal, is that still a high watermark for Mark McGowan or has some of that started to 
wash off already. Well, I think as you've seen COVID cases increase, you know, WA has just had the Omicron peak that's been seen in Western Australia. I, I think that's probably started to wash off just a little bit. Uh, however, you know, today, most of the restrictions around masks, they've been lifted. The interesting question will be, you know, what effect does Mark McGowan genuinely have? Because in 2017, he won in a landslide. At the 2019 election, that didn't translate necessarily sure. to, to votes. So, uh, you know, he won in a bigger landslide in 2021. What's going to happen this year? Jake, thanks for your perspectives. Local, we're trying to uh, make a national program as locally focused as we can. Now, our coverage did begin out in Cottesloe earlier today. We were talking there to Teal Independent Kate Cheney. This is Liberal Heartland. The margin is double digits. Here was our discussion with the Teal Independent Kate Cheney. <laughs> Kate Cheney, it is great to be back in your state. I must say, if someone had said to me three years ago, in this election, you'll be talking about the seat of Curtin, where a Liberal MP might be under threat, they would have said, I was mad. So the question for you, uh, why here and why now? So I was asked by a community group, Curtin Independent, to, to run as an independent. Um, it's very much my community and I couldn't really have run anywhere else. So that's the, that's the why here. Um, why now? I'm, I've felt d deeply disillusioned with the, the leadership that we're seeing on some really big issues. Um, and I think there's, a, there's an opportunity now, and, I'm, and that sense of disillusionment is, is what drove that community group to be looking for a candidate. All right, let's step through those. Quite obviously, climate change is the main motivator. Uh, what else? So I think integrity underpins everything else. And, and broadly under integrity, I group uh, the Federal Anti-Corruption Commission, which is a, a key check and balance in our system, as well as transparency and political donations. We need to know who's actually funding our parties and why. Um, and truth in political advertising, the way women are treated in Canberra, all of that is part of integrity. All right, we might break down both of those, climate and integrity, but just as a big picture observation, it seems that the days of independence right around the country, trying to make it into the federal parliament on essentially local issues has long passed. There's this whole grouping of you now who quite literally want to change the nation. Um, why is that such a conscious choice on your behalf? Sure, you'd be representing the people of Curtin, but you're actually going with a higher ideal in mind. I mean, I'm doing this because I think it's really important. And the conversations that I have in my community are about those, those macro long-term issues and, and the vacuum that's been left by the major parties on, on these really long-term issues. Right, but in the seat of Curtin, uh, it could be argued, couldn't it, that being long held and more recently in government, people have done pretty well out of that through the Julie Bishop era, for instance. That was a powerful voice at a powerful table, like the cabinet room, securing things for this electorate. You wouldn't have any of those advantages. My community and the people I speak to care about the future of our children. And it's less about whether we've got funding for the surf club and more about whether there's actually going to be a, a coastline that, that our kids can play on. So those, those macro issues, uh, I think, is where federal government should really be focused. What is your actual platform? What if you had a voice in negotiations, particularly in a hung parliament environment, for instance, what are the actual initiatives that you'd want negotiated? For a start, setting targets that are consistent with the science this decade Which has to be a big part of that. Which means what sort of number? Well, I, I would think 50%. By 2030. By that's 2030, a, yeah, that's That's a 50% right. figure. With all of that in mind, do you have any inclination which way you would go in the event of a hung parliament where climate was the principal consideration for you? The best I can do for my community is negotiate in that, in that situation on the issues that my community are saying are important, climate and integrity. And on integrity, uh, a commission of some sort, but broadly speaking, with what powers? We need an integrity commission with teeth that can do its own investigations, have public hearings, uh, act on referrals from the public. 
uh, and make findings. OK. In the interest of transparency then, uh, I think you've been able to give progressive updates as to your financing and uh, war chest, if you like. Where, where are you up to now and the Climate 200 component of that? I'm running the most transparent sure. political campaign in the country, so you can go to my website any day and, and check yourself in real time. And I think we're at about six or seven hundred thousand dollars. I'll have to check. I think about 40 percent of that um, is from Climate 200. What sort of actual force have you been able to muster when it comes to volunteers and campaign person power? When we've got about 700 volunteers from across the electorate, most of them have never been involved in politics before. And it's really exciting, that, that sense of empowerment. Many of them, I imagine, correct me if I'm wrong, would be broadly sympathetic and past supporters of the Liberal Party? They come from all, all, um, all parts and that's been another really lovely part of that experience is uh, seeing the, the hope and, and optimism that people have that there is a different way of doing things and they can channel their disillusionment into some positive change. You've got to pull the Liberal vote down primarily, Celia Hammonds, to the low 40s. What makes you think that you're in striking range? Uh, it's entirely based on the conversations I'm having from Mosman Park to Scarborough and you know, all through the electorate. Um, people are ready for change. Because very few people, particularly from this side of the country, would get into or seek to get into federal politics for the money. In that context, if you were sitting on a crossbench as a, a regular independent, you'd commit to seeking multiple terms? Oh, look, it's very hard to predict that too far out. Um, I'm doing it because I passionately think that my community needs to be better represented and I have faith in our democratic process. So I would, I would do that job to the best of my ability um, for as long as the community thought that I, I was doing a good job of it. Well, a few votes to be secured before you could even contemplate that, but for sharing some of your time in a busy schedule. Kate Cheney, thanks for joining us today. Thanks very much, Greg. OK, just a final footnote. We did invite Celia Hammond, the Liberal member for Curtin, and Liberal candidate Vince Connolly in Cowan, but their programs didn't uh, allow them to make it here for our coverage this afternoon. Fran, uh, all eyes will soon enough shift towards Sunday, the Labor launch. That's kind of framed the reason why we've come west, but also a very important day for Anthony Albanese and his team coming out of COVID isolation. I guess uh, Anthony Albanese uh, wants to you know, use this as the momentum shift, the springboard, if you like, into the back half of this campaign, Fran. That's right. It'll be interesting to see if we get much actually from Anthony Albanese new in this launch. You know, he's been criticised as a small target. Will there be more? We'll have to wait and see. You enjoy your time there in the West, Greg. That's it from us for today. Yeah. More on our top stories up next. Stay with us here on ABC News. We'll see you on Monday. Yeah.